I want to thank you all for coming, of course, and I want to thank Jeff uh, Pirtle here for inviting us at Anderson University for allowing us this beautiful facility. Uh, my name is Joe Marcinkowitz, as you probably already know, and I started making trumpets around 1983. There's a long story how did it all happen. I was a trumpet player first. I played with Stan Kenton, played with Woody, sat in with Maynard, uh, Don Ellis for seven years and things of that nature. And so I have a uh, an extended background as a performer. Uh, in the early 80s or 70s, you, you guys would know that the computers started coming on board, uh, synthesizers, sampling, and all kinds of things like this. And the studios started to realize that we don't need five trumpets anymore. We need two. And we'll overdub them and just stuff like that. So the side guys, which is what I was doing, was getting pushed out. Of the of the industry for the for the really good guys like Alan Vizzuti, um, who's a dear friend of mine. And so, uh, what the heck could I do? When I was in the Navy back in the fifties of sixty five to uh, sixty nine, I started to work on trumpets as a sideline. If I play, why can't I fix them? Um, and I've been very good with my hands. I've been blessed with that. So, I started working on making fixing horns right around nineteen sixty six. Has, when I got out of the service and I'm in San Francisco as a trumpet player, work got very, very lean. So I started doing more repair work, went to a store by the name of Whitney's Band Instruments, which are no longer in business, by the way. Um, took me in their arms and said, hey, man, we need someone to fix horns. And I didn't know that much about it. I didn't know what a dent mandrel was. I didn't know what dent hammers were, etc., 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 let alone soldering and brazing and all that other stuff that you need to do this stuff. Well, they took me in, and there was a little technician in the back. His name was Chris Grassi, little hippie. This was back in the 60s when things were a little different. <laughs> Anybody understand the 60s would understand what I'm talking about. But he said, no, no, there's a, here's a couple of mandrels for you. Here's a couple of dent hammers. Here's a torch, propane thing, and just do it. So that's how it all started. Right? One thing led to another. I met some very great trumpet players at that time. Donald Berg came into my shop. Who knows who Benny Harris is? Well, nobody. Okay, Benny Harris is considered the father of bebop. He like taught Dizzy and a bunch of guys like that. He came into my shop, so I was surrounded with all these wonderful Johnny Capola. Anybody know who Johnny Capola is? Comrade Gaza. That's my background in, in the jazz world, as opposed to the legitimate world. But my roots are legitimate. A lot of people know Marcinkwitz mouthpieces for like Bobby Shue. And guys like that would play altissimo register playing. But my roots were all in the legit, the one and a half C range, Bach ones, big trumpets, big sounds, just like Susan was talking about. So anyway, um, I'm starting to make mouthpieces. I'm kind of cut through this so we can get into a question and answer thing. Um, started making mouthpieces in um, California. The word got out. Bob Reeves was there. Do people know Bob Reeves? He was there, Bert Herrick, who's my mentor, who's making mouthpieces at the same. And things started to go well. I was a new kid on the block, so people kept coming to me, the Findlay brothers, the Condoli brothers, all these really neat people. <clears throat> Let's see what the new kids got. And apparently I did my job because a lot of these people are still playing my stuff today. Well, I met this other guy. His name was Herb Albert. And Herb came into my life and embraced what I was doing. And uh, he came out to my house. This was incredible, Mr. Herb Alpert, who I, I knew him by his music, but I never met him. So this was a real treat. He came up to my house. He sat down on this old log I had in my house while I was working on a mouthpiece for him. And we're sitting there talking, and he kind of looked at me and says, can you make me a trumpet? Well, the first words out of my mouth was, yes, that, that would not be a problem, never making a trumpet before. <laughs> so with his kindness and his financial support and his personal support uh, allowed me to start the trumpet building mouthpiece business. Now, the really the thing that really started this whole thing for me, there's a lot of guys that make mouthpieces with their hands, and they're still doing that, and that's very important, like I did. I had a friend of mine who was working at the store with me at the time. His name was Ed Krauss. Ed Krauss was a repair man for string, or not string, but woodwind instruments, clarinets, flutes, and that type of stuff. And he said, Joe, you got to come to the West Tech show. What's a West Tech show? Well, the West Tech show is a show where they introduce all the latest CNC, 
computer-aided type of technologies, mills, turning lathes, you name it, they had it. I had a brand new family. I didn't have time to take off from work because they didn't pay you in those days to go to, to go to these shows and see what's happening. So he convinced me to go out to this show. At the time I was doing this, I was studying with Bert Harrick, and Bert Harrick's lathe, you know, 800 RPMs was as fast as it would go. So I walk into this building at the Anaheim Convention Center, and there's this Cincinnati lathe sitting there that's probably 12 foot long, 14 feet long, and it's zipping through, and I'm looking at the RPMs, 8,000. RPMs, I couldn't believe. 8,000 RPMs, you can cut grass. When I was used to cutting grass, it's 800 RPMs. Well, I was amazed. I went to the phone to call Bert, tell Bert he had passed away that day. So that was a very sad time for me. But that's how it all started. I was like, oh my God, we can make mouthpieces with computer aids. And so when Herb came into the picture, I finally convinced Herb that I needed to buy one of these lathes. And it was a lot of money. Uh, a lot of money. So that's how the whole thing started. Um, from that, it went to making the trumpets. Now, I just didn't do that on my own. What had happened is that in the course that the business was starting up and Herb was involved, other people in the industry started to contact me, wanted to come and work at the shop and, and stuff like this. And I met a man by the name of Joe Lintz, who was one of Olds's, um general manager type of thing in the back of the shop. He was the, uh, the guy who set the tools up made sure that everybody, a foreman, so to speak. Well, he came to my shop and started to teach me about production because my mindset was one thing at a time, but he was thinking, got to build 75 horns for a hoarder. You better learn how to build 75 horns and make the parts in a production type of rug. That's how it happened. At that same time in the 80s, this was 83 and 84, I got a call from a guy by the name of Claude Gordon. I said, Joe, I heard a lot about your mouthpieces, he said, and I, we had a casual conversation. And he said, I'm going to send you some students down, and I want you to make them a mouthpiece, and I want you to put a 20 drill in it. And I want you to put the biggest backboard you could possibly put in it. Well, of course I did. I worked with him for, oh, two or three years, and I, I got too busy. I couldn't do the ones and twosies anymore, so we kind of, he got sick at that time, too. So many years went by. Mouthpiece business started to build up. We captured several different artists, as you know, if you've been to my website, I don't want to sit there and tell you about my uh, yays with, with some of my clients. But uh, I got a call from Patty Gordon. This is 10 years after uh, Claude had passed away. And she asked me if I would be interested in making the Claude Gordon trumpet. Well, I was elated. I was, yeah, knew nothing about the horn. So Patty was kind enough to send me his personal horns and two or three other horns that they got from uh, another company, which I won't mention. There were, well, I will mention, there's two companies that made the Claude Gordon trumpet. It was the Benj trumpet and the Selmer. For whatever reasons, I can't talk about why he left one company went to the other company. But I can only tell you this, and I might be get in trouble for this, they didn't treat him right. I don't think they realized what this man was doing for the music world. So when I got the call to do this, I was like, okay, I can't build these horns unless I get a letter from Selmer saying that they don't tend to do this anymore because I wasn't going to start to build a horn and, and allude to the fact that I could make it better without knowing that they may 10 years from now go and build the horn again. And I didn't want that to happen. So we got all the clearance paperwork done like that. Patty also got them to send me the bell mandrel that uh, Claude Gordon Selmer was made on, and the lead pipe mandrels. And that's how the magic happened. We started to look at the, the way the Claude Gordon trumpets was made, and it wasn't made well. I'm, if you have old Claude Gordon trumpets, I'm sure they're fine. So don't, I'm not trying to like, encourage you to go out and buy another trumpet. No, they're fine. But when I got the horn and started doing my measurements, there were some inherent problems. I am a individual company. I did not inherit what I have. I built this from the floor up, so I wasn't under any rules or regulations that said I had to do it this way or this way. It was, I was an artist doing my thing. With the basic principles of acoustics, though, there's nothing magic about trumpet building. There's nothing magic about mouthpieces. The magic is if it works for you. That's what the magic is. There's no esoteric things that are floating around the air. It's just all science. So when we started to look into the trumpets, per se, there were things that were inherently wrong that we corrected in our line of, of 
uh, Clyde Gordon trumpets. But the thing that was unique about my position was that the companies out there today that are building CG horns do not have the right to use the name Claude Gordon. I do because I had Patty Gordon's blessings for that only after we had made several horns and had pushed them out into the marketplace and had people who, like Jeff Girdle, play them and test them for us and give us his opinion. Uh, Mohan was another guy, uh, Larry Souza, half a dozen or something. And I got some pretty nice reports back. Some said it was better, some said, eh, I don't know. But it's always an individual thing. That's how the Claude Gordon trumpet uh, became a reality for me. The Claude Gordon mouthpiece, the same thing. When, when, when Claude died, I got all of his original equipment. And we have computer-aided technology with computers and screens that we can put programs and we can look at it. And I will tell you also this today, that the, the computer technology today is nothing new. It was when I started it. In 1983, 1984, when I got my first machine, I was the first company on the planet to put production mouthpieces out with single point cutting technology. Now, what does that mean to you? That means every mouthpiece that this company makes, me, they're the same, each and every one, okay? Because of the computers. We were the first to do that. We don't use form tools to do any of our mouthpiece work. Everything is computer aided programming. Uh, I do have a little thing I'd like to. Now, also, bear with me here. It's the first time I'm doing this. I'm a little bit nervous, as you can probably tell. We did make a program, a, a, a video, and I can maybe talk through some of these things so you can kind of see how mouthpieces are made. And for the most part, ladies and gentlemen, the, the whole planet doesn't miss them. We'll get into what makes them different here in a moment. Okay, can you pause that? This is a what we call a plug. We buy brass material and we only buy US made products because it's better. We've tried foreign material, foreign brass from Japan. We bought it from China and the, the alloys that they use in brass was slightly different and it wasn't up to the quality we want. Brass has two basic alloys, copper and zinc, that's it. When you start adding lead, tin, other, other alloys, it starts to change the material. It also makes it cheaper, but it, there's inherent problems with that. This is the plug that we put in the, that, the part that you see on the left, the silver part, is where the mouthpiece goes in, it's called the collet. Okay, run that for me, please. The gentleman you're listening to is Rick Frost. This is how we contour the rim. Now we're removing about 80% of the material. Now the material you might want, where's the material go? Because we're a green shop or think green, that all gets recycled. So if we buy brass, we, when we first started, brass was 72 cents a pound. It's now almost $4 a pound. Our prices have not changed much. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Right now, it's doing the second, part, the second part of it so that we can stamp that part of the mountain. That's called center drilling. Okay, pause for a second. Now, center drilling is very crucial. When you put something in the lathe and you take it out, it doesn't always go back the same way, no matter how expensive your lathe is because it's held by three points or even six points. But it's hard to put something in the lathe and make it perfect. So we do all of the first part of the mouthpiece, the rim, bite, the cup, the throat, and the hole, or the drill or venturi. All while it's in one position, so we make sure that each mouthpiece is the same each and every time that we do it. Go ahead. Now we're drilling the center hole, or what you call the drill or the venturi. So while this is being done, there's lots of flood coolant in here. But we took that out so you guys can have a visual effect of what we're doing. Now, pause it again. All of our mouthpieces, holes that are put on, all of our mouthpieces are done with reamers and not drills. A drill is just that. It drills a hole. Doesn't make a hole accurate. 
Now, when we talk about accuracies here, a lot of us can understand what a sixteenth of an inch is, a thirty-second, or a sixty-fourth. We're dealing with thousands. So when we make a mouthpiece, we're going to hold, without any reservations, a thousandth of an inch. Let me tell you what a thousandth of visual is. Do you all know what a thousandth of an inch is? So I'll give you a visual. Take a piece of hair. Normal hair is about three thousandths thick. Take one third of that. That is a thousandth of an inch. Those are the dimensions that we hold. Go ahead. So now we just made the center hole of the mouthpiece accurate. Now this is the call of boring. This is going to contour the cup based on the program that we created for the mouthpiece. We make mouthpieces that are similar to Bach. Bach 1.5C, 3C, 5C, that type of stuff. Why did we do that? Anybody want to know that? Okay. Why did we do that? We did it because the other companies out there, and there are several of them, are not concerned with accuracy because they look at the mouthpiece as a necessity, not a necessity. I believe in my heart of hearts that the most important investment you're going to make as a brass player is your mouthpiece. The horn is secondary. Because if you have the right mouthpiece for the person, okay, if I look at him and said, you have to play a seven and a half C, that would be ludicrous for me to say that. You, you play the mouthpiece that fits him the best. Then the horn is secondary. Then it goes material, finish, and goes on and on. Like a car. Have to have an engine first, then everything else is secondary. Without the engine, you got nothing. The second operation is where we're going to put the backboard and the mouthpiece down. Okay? There's a hundred million backboards. And basically, there's some very simple rules of thumb with the backboard. If a backboard is tight, and it doesn't matter where it is tight, it becomes an argument. Mouthpiece is going to give you projection. That's what the tight backboard does. And there's a lot of other things that are involved, but basically that's what it does. The fatter the backboard, the more width of the sound. If you're playing in an orchestra, you pretty want your sound to blend with the orchestra. And hopefully the sound will get out if it's in a good hall. If you have a very small backboard, you're going to be too bright, and you're going to get, what, what did she call it? Yeah. Uh, and that's what you're going to get. So the backboard is very, very important. We do the, sec the backboard off the machine to ensure the type of backboard that we want to put into the, into the particular mouthpiece that we do. We do that for two reasons. One, if we put it in the machine, it takes too long, and it doesn't need that kind of accuracy to put a backboard tool into it. We make all our own backboard tools, by the way. So we do that as a second, separate operation. What you're seeing now, then, is the shank of the mouthpiece, or the Morse taper. That's another thing that I don't know if you guys know about this. When Kahn and Bach were in their heyday back in the 40s and 50s, they had tremendous ideas, a lot of workflow, 350 people each worked in their businesses. Now that's all gone. It's, it's the, what I knew of the music industry doesn't exist anymore. So Kahn came out with a taper that was a 48, uh, 48, 48 thousandths per inch as opposed to 50 thousandths per inch. It's only two thousandths of an inch, like I say. If you look at a human hair and give me two pieces of that human hair, that's the, the, the differences. But the problem was, when you're playing a con mouthpiece that you really loved and you put in a Bach trumpet, it would wiggle. Or vice versa. If you're playing on a Bach mouthpiece, put in a con instrument. So they started to realize, wow, we just lost this $500 sale because the mouthpiece wouldn't fit our horn. So then they start to standardize it. So that's what we're doing here on the computer machines. I can't see it very well. I apologize for that. So there's ways to fix that, but again, we didn't have a chance to, to get together. The taper is very, very important. So that tells you how far the mouthpiece is going to go in the horn and how far it may not go in the horn, depending on the player. Now, custom work is always for the player. It's a specific thing. If I make a mouthpiece for him, I make it for him. I always recommend that you buy a stock mouthpiece. And the reason for that is, even for uh, 
professional players like our heroes, like uh, um, Bobby Shu, for an example, plays on our mouthpieces all the time. Now he is endorsing Yamaha, but Bob and I go back a long ways, and he buys a lot of our stuff and sells it to his kids because he knows one they're accurate. We make four different mouthpieces with his name on it. That's very, very important that the tapers and the way the mouthpiece is being made is made properly. Okay, let's see what we can do. Can we shut the house lights? Yeah. All right, there we go. Now we're removing the other material we talked about earlier. And every time I see this, it excites me. Because remind you, I used to do this at 800, that's like uh, 4,500 RPM here, with a tool that painstakingly take me four hours to make a mouthpiece. Takes five minutes now in this type of technology. If we use Swiss automatics with form tools, you can make a mouthpiece in about 40 seconds. Now we're putting in the design. Now, what's the difference between a finished pass and a first pass? How fast we're cutting the material. If the lathe's spinning at a certain RPM and you bring the cutter across fast, you're going to get a lot of roughness. If you bring the cutter across slow, you get a really fine finish. And there's the stamp put on. And if you notice, we had a center and it's held up, so there's no distortion of when we put the stamp on like some other companies might do. That's what we do when we make up our sequence mouthpiece. That's the pride that we take in. But there are two hidden problems that the whole industry has. The first problem is, okay, after the mouthpiece is done, we're going to buff it. Okay, we're going to buff the mouthpiece. Now, if you don't have the right type of a buffing person with the right attitude, you can kiss that mouthpiece goodbye. Because it doesn't take very much time to take a mouthpiece on a spindle Put it on a buffing weight that's traveling at 3600 RPMs with compounds to change the contours. It doesn't take much at all. So we train our buffers. We spend a lot of time and we have special tools that we have made, cone buffs that go inside the mouthpiece without destroying the bite. The bite is where you suffer the worst. When you go to a store and you buy a standard sized mouthpiece, let's say a 7C, we don't have to mention the other company's name that makes a 7C. Why are they all different? Now, you and I both know that they don't plan that, but in the big companies that make, you know, 500,000 mouthpieces a year to my 4,000, uh, they have to do something to make that work. So they have automated buffing machines. It has six, it's a big table, and there's six buffing heads on it, and you put the mouthpiece in the picture, and it just goes click, click, click. With no regard to is it going too much, or too little, too fast. Just everything's done here by hand. And all the stuff is done, and we have templates that we watch over the mouthpiece as the buffers are buffing to make sure that they're not taking too much material off. Now, the neat part about that is if we get a buffer that's a little bit too aggressive, we can compensate for that on the machine tool end. In other words, if we know a guy or gal, we've had both working in the shop, who's buffing a mouthpiece, and they're on a particular, we make a mouthpiece for Mike Bax. You all know who Mike Bax is? He's a very weak, I met him in the Navy, I could tell you all kinds of stories over dinner. But we're really great friends. And he came to me and wanted me to make a, a version of the 13A4A, which is a like a 7E basically. Cut. Well, his mouthpiece bite is real critical to Mike. So we had made a batch of mouthpieces and we had a new buffer came in and I sent some mouthpieces out to Mike and Mike said, man, these aren't the same mouthpieces and of course that just put chills up and down my back because that's not what I'm about. Send the bout paces back and we measured them and found out absolutely right that the inside bite was being buffed too much. So we had to overcompensate for that on the machine tool side of the, of the manufacturing end so that the buffer get in there and go a little hard, the contour is still there. Do you all follow what I'm trying to say? Okay. That's the first thing the industry really needs to think about if they're going to advocate quality. Now, with that being said, a little side note over here. We're the only company on the planet that tells you where we measure from. 
Nobody else does. I've had companies say, oh, our mouthpieces are within four thousandths. Four thousandths of what? Four thousandths from this mouthpiece or from what? We tell you guys exactly where we measure from. If you want to find out if our cup depth is a certain depth, we tell you how we measure that. If you want to find out about the inside bite, we tell you how we measure that. You know why we do that? Because I'm looking for you guys to call me a liar. Now, if you call me a liar, I'll take the mouthpiece back at no charge and give you a brand new one. That's right, if we screw up. So we have a complete return policy uh, guaranteeing our, our mouthpieces. The second most important thing is the plating process. We do our own plating at Mars Inquist because we tried sending parts out. <sighs> they don't get it. Mouthpieces come back with dents in them. You can't fix dents. When you get a dent in the mouthpiece on a brand new mouthpiece, it's gone. It's cut it to a visualizer. If you get a scratch on a mouthpiece, you can sometimes buff that out. But on a new product, you can't. So the, the plating process is just as important as the manufacturing all of this. Now I'm going to pause here for a second and open this up to, to, to answers or, or questions. So please, does anybody have questions? Yes. Yes. Well, there's several companies make stainless steel, but why? It's a hard metal to work with. It doesn't have the density as brass. Brass works. Stainless is cold. You take it out, it's cold on your face right away. Brass isn't like that. The world seems to want to do. Have you looked lately at trumpet makers in the world today? I'm not going to mention names, but my God, they don't look like trumpets anymore. They look like sculptures. Okay, they've missed the point. <laughs> Putting, well, back to your question. We use brass because it works. It's worked for the last 150 years. Uh, we've tried plastics. We've tried Delrin. We've tried nylon. We've tried all kinds of copper. Copper's really hard to work with because it's so soft. And it keeps coming back to the brass. Now, unless you have a particular problem with material where you get cold sores or you get things happening on your face because of brass, that's not called brass poisoning. We grew up with it's brass poisoning. What it is, if a brass mouthpiece is raw, it gathers germs that don't just go away because it's a porous material. When you silver plate a mouthpiece, just the porousness of the coarseness goes away. So germs don't like it. Like with stainless steel, germs don't like stainless steel because it's a very fine material. Well, why'd you do it with stainless? Why'd you do it with stainless? Why didn't you use brass or make a screw in? What did he say? I can buff that out and you've changed your mouthpiece. See what I'm saying? But that's not a bad thing. It's just something that you should be realized. There's a lot of things we can, on the brass, we can buff dents out too, but we can't because it changes the contour and you can't say this is the same anymore. And it's a very hard material to work with. Any questions? Please. When I was at the last year, I came across mouthpieces that seem to be elliptical rather than Hyperbolic, it's called. Yes. You know who started that? His name was Terry. Terry, 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 Terry Ross, who was uh, before, who was the lead trumpet player with uh, Woody Herman? Uh, Bill Chase. He was the lead trumpet player with Woody Herman before Bill Chase got on the scene. And he designed that thing thinking, well, we're going to use the wide part of your lip and the small, it doesn't work. Some people can make it work. If it's, You can make anything work. The human spirit is so incredibly good that we, I can give you anything, and if you Pursued it, you could play it. So some guys, they were stamped out uh, what they call drop forging those mouthpieces. I've made a few. I knew Terry back in San Francisco and I lived there. But it doesn't work. It only works for one or two people, like the double cup, our tuba double cups. When those mouthpieces were designed, the whole idea of the double cup was is if you're playing with a pucker, where you're pushing in like this with your face, then you go to the second cup, and then because you're pushing in, you're using less vibration material and you can play high notes. That's what it was about. Harry James, my hero, 
is why I started to play trumpet, played on a Perdue Five Star Double Cup. Now the guy who's making those is uh, Dick Ackwright up in Oakland. He's got the patents on that, so we made them for a while. But why? I didn't want to do that anymore. The problem is you can't get the mount pieces in logical assortment of sizes. They come in one, two, three, four, five sizes. They don't have a lot, so. If you're playing on a Pardubin and you want something a little small, it's going to be hard for you to get that. When we came up with our nomenclature, the first thing that really got in my mind when I started this way back in 83 was we took all these different mount pieces and laid them out on the table. The Warburtons, the Shilkies, the Box, every, every possible thing. None of it made sense. Chase, trumpets. Anybody have questions about trumpets? Yes. He's talking about how far the mouthpiece should go into for the lead pipe. Theoretically, the mouthpiece should touch the lead pipe because it's an extension of the backbore. If the backbore is correct, the backbore extension should go with the lead pipe. And be. The reason why the industry doesn't do this is because after a while, you start hitting the end of the lead pipe and you flare it. And it causes, that's why we back the mouthpiece up. Correct distance for all intents and purposes is about an eighth of an inch, 125 thousandths. If you get past a quarter inch out, you start having queasy notes. Certain notes on the horn is going to be bad because of the turbulence that's happening right there. Most of the turbulence in the trumpet happens right there at the lead pipe end. Bell making. We had a whole thing for you. Can we show a little bit of that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Trumpets are made with loving care. Each trumpet is made by hand. Our shop is all handcrafted stuff. The difference between handcrafted and machining is the quality of the control. How much solder are you putting on? How well do the parts fit? Our trumpets are made very, very tight because of compression. If we had the time, we could talk about the differences in compression, why trumpets play better than some. Uh, any other questions real quick before I? You know, I drove three flights to get here, went through a lot of do's, and no one's asking questions. Come on. So efficient. I'm so efficient. I only touched the surface. Go ahead. If I had to make the trumpet all the parts from scratch, it would take about two months. If I had to make all, but we don't do that. When we make pistons, we make 400 of them. If we make a valve body, we'll cut the material, all the parts, we make assemble 400 of them. Valve caps, same thing like that. So it takes about 20 hours. When all the parts are pre-manufactured, the bell's already been bent and made and all that stuff. It takes seven hours just to make a bell. Why? Because Monel, by its nature, is just a much nicer material. It's, it's, it's anti-acidic. It, 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 it machines very, very well. And that's really the only basic reason. Now some people are going back to stainless steel. I personally would like to go back to a brass piston with nickel, with nickel plate. But it's a Watts nickel. And if you're really interested in that, we can talk about that too, about the, what, why that worked. The, the first trumpets that were made back Back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, like uh, they made all brass pistons and they nickel plated them. And those pistons, like on the old benches that were done in uh, Chicago and Bur early Burbank benches, those pistons lasted forever. Why? Well, because the, the nickel that we put on the watch nickel is a little softer than the Monel. And if it's a little softer, now that's how much softer. That's another thing that we get into the technical aspects. Allows the piston to seat with the, with the brass better than a very hard material trying to beat the brass inside. So a lot of times pistons just don't want to see. We don't ultrasonic clean the horns because we have a, a, a cleaning process. We use different types of cleans. We use uh, vapor degreases and stuff. Ultrasonics is good, but ultrasonics only gets out loose dirt. It won't get out things that, you, that acids can do, like when you have corrosiveness when, when you're playing like he never washes his trumpet, Mr. Pearl down here. So he has to send it out to an acid shop every four or five months. <laughs>
I want to thank, I have to run, I'm sorry we didn't have more time, but I could talk about this stuff for hours. And uh, thank you again, Jeff, for having me. Thank you. Our boots right over there.